Hello, and welcome to Brief Theological Introductions to the Book of Mormon. My name is Joseph Stewart. I work for the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship at Brigham Young University. We are proud to partner with Roble del Sur to bring scholarship produced by Latter-day Saint disciples to members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, especially those who speak Spanish and Portuguese. There are 12 books in this series the Maxwell Institute has produced, entitled The Book of Mormon Brief Theological Introductions. You can find the first five books in the series produced in Spanish at mi.byu.edu slash breves. Tonight, you'll hear from Jim Faulkner, Senior Research Fellow at the Institute. He has taught at BYU for more than four decades as a professor of philosophy and has written extensively about Latter-day Saint beliefs in scripture. He wrote the brief theological introduction to the Book of Mosiah and the Book of Mormon. Our co-host tonight is Sharon Harris, a professor of English at BYU, who wrote the brief theological introduction to Enos, Jerem, and Omni for the series. Professor Harris served a mission in Fortaleza, Brazil, and her she sends her love to any friends and family members who may be watching tonight. So here's the plan for how things are going to go. Jim and Sharon will speak for about a half an hour. You can send in questions on the YouTube chat. If you're listening in Spanish, you'll be watching on the Neil A. Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarships Spanish YouTube channel. And if you're listening in Portuguese, you'll be on the Roble channel for, for Portuguese. A translator named Berenice will then ask Jim questions and answers with help from the translation team to bring them to you. When you ask a question, please note your name and where you are watching so that we can include that, so that we can feel a community uh, that's building across the world of Latter-day Saints devoted to building faith and discovering more from the Book of Mormon. With that in mind, let's get started. We're glad you're with us. Thank you, uh, jo Joseph, and um, thank you to all the translators and the foundation and the Maxwell Institute for making this possible. We're really glad to be here. I'm Sharon Harris, and I'm Jim Faulkner, and we'll be looking forward to discussing <coughs> the brief theological introduction to Mosiah tonight. Uh, so we'll just jump right into this, uh, if this works. I want to uh, share a quotation that Jim has in the op in the introduction to his book, where he says, it is important to note that the writers of the Book of Mormon were not writing theology. They were preaching the doctrine of Christ. And you go on to talk a little bit about uh, theology and what it might be. But I wonder, could you just kind of tell people what you have in mind there? What the, if, when you say they're not writing theology, they're preaching the doctrine of Christ, what is theology? Well, there, it's a little bit, uh, my, what I wrote is a little bit misleading because there are just lots of kinds of theology. Um, but when most people think about uh, non-specialists, especially think about theology, they think about uh, sets of rational uh, explanations for beliefs or doctrines. And I think it's, you know, th that, that notion of theology is very common. And so I, 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 when I was saying that, I was trying to say the Book of Mormon doesn't have those and we ought not to expect to be able to pull them out. They're not hidden. They're just, they're doing something entirely different. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. And so what <clears throat> would you say this theological introduction is doing? Would you, is there a different yeah. word for theology going on there? Well, the t I guess there are two ways you can think about what the word theology means. There's our talk about God, and then there's God's talk about himself, mm -hmm. what he says, his re revelations. And it seems to me that... Um, when the the ordinary term that I was uh, using is our talk about God, and if we're going to do theology, if we're going to be talking about God, the place to start is with His talk about Himself. Mm -hmm. So in the Scriptures, with our His revelations of Himself, I think that's the best kind of theology. It's not the only kind, and I'm not, I don't, I'm not meaning to say that the other kinds are wrong or ought not to be done. I'm just trying to say, I do think that the best theology is reflection and thought about scripture. Cool, great. So if that's kind of the project of the book, do this kind of reflection and thinking about what God says uh, in his own revelations, give us an overview of 
your book and this is what it looks like. Um, and so what, what are you introducing about Isaiah, <clears throat> or excuse me, about Mosiah in this book? <clears throat> well, there are, there's a lot going on in the book, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's impossible to write about everything that's there. What I wanted to do was to pick out four or five uh, themes in, uh, in, in various chapters and try to focus in on what those particular themes said. And I have to be honest, they were, I picked them out by, by asking the question, what interests me? Mm -hmm. right. sure. I mean, uh -huh. uh, I'm, <laughs> when you write the book, you get to make that. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm quite sure that someone else writing their own brief theolog theological introduction would say, well, I'm going to write about these other five things. Um, so I'm not, so, so there's nothing uh, uh, special about my choice of five okay. things. It's just, except that, you know, they were special to me, maybe not to you, but they were, they were special to me. And I tried to say to my, as I, I asked those questions, when I, when I think this chapter or this theme interests me, what is it about it that I find interesting? Why is it? For example, I have, uh, I'm a convert to the church and I first read the Book of Mormon. So I, I joined the church when I was 15. I first read the Book of Mormon when I was 18 or 19. Mm -hmm. And when I read the Book of Mormon, chapter four of Mosiah just stood out for me. And it has, it's been perhaps my favorite uh, piece of scripture has been for the last 50 plus years so it's just it's to me it's an amazing thing so i wanted to know for my own thinking what is it about that chapter that attracts me what is it that i keep why is i keep coming back to it and, and every time i read it i think i find something new so what's going on there there was also there's this the beginning of chapter 15 and I find that just incredibly mysterious. I, I've always thought this just makes no sense. And I would just read it and go on. Um, I think that uh, what I decided to do was to see whether that was perhaps a mistake on my part, mm -hmm. to try to see, can I make sense of it? Can I say something? And so it, it was that kind of an, uh, uh, sort of experimenting with ideas and questions that led me to pick out and and do the things that i did very cool well we'll um hopefully get a chance to talk about both mosiah 4 and 15 here in a second um so then maybe let's think about this you talk about in chapter one that uh, mosiah is written out of order and with a lot of fragments uh, you, you say Mosiah is a remnant of a book telling the story of a remnant of the people of Nephi, themselves a remnant of the people of Lehi, whose people were a remnant of Israel. Um, and maybe say a little bit about what is happening that the story in Mosiah is put in different orders and, and what's at stake with that? Well, I'm not, <clears throat> I'm not sure of all of the things. And part of the problem with reading the book of Mosiah is that we lost the first part of it. It appears that we did when the 116 pages were lost. But um, as it stands, and we've canonized it as it stands, as it stands, that book, uh, by being out of order, makes us focus on the Sermon of King Benjamin before we read the sermons of, of Abinadi. Okay. And, um, so what order? were those chronologically? Chronologically, Abinadi comes first. Mm -hmm. Now, I didn't notice this out of orderness until a couple of years ago. I've been reading this uh -huh. the whole my whole life thinking that's, you know, there's King Benjamin and then there's Abinadi and I just, I mistook the order of the text for the chronological order. Uh -huh. But when I started looking at what the text says, Moroni or Mormon, whoever the editor is, has taken the sermons of Benjamin and put them before uh -huh. the sermons of Abinadi. And I thought that was really quite interesting. Uh -huh. That must be for a reason. Sure. Uh -huh. you know. right. And then so the question would be for me, what was that reason? Right. What's going on there? Okay. Um, so that gives a kind of a start to see what 
how the order might be working and how it can affect our understanding of the uh, theology, perhaps, that we can get from the book. Um, you also talk about how the, having the story in different orders means that in, in different sequence means we have lots of different pieces in fragments. Um, are you, and then you say something about how can we prevent fragmentation? Um, is that, what's at stake there? So like what? <clears throat> well, I, it, it's interesting to me as well that um, each of the leaders of the people that we see, except for Noah, evidently, but each of the other leaders is really concerned about the fragmentation of his people. He doesn't want them to be divided into groups or to have somebody leave and not come back. He wants to have these as a unified people. And that is part of the question that they have. Mm -hmm. How can we maintain our unity, even though there are all kinds of forces fragmenting us? And I, I think that, that the quotation you read earlier for me is especially relevant because here are people who know that they are a fragment of a fragment of a fragment. I mean, you know, if you're just thinking about Israel, you get Israel and then Judah and then you just keep breaking down. And finally, what you get are the people of the Book of Mormon that we're reading about. And they, they know that history. This is very much right. a part of their own understanding of who they are. And their leaders are saying, this just can't continue. You can't just keep breaking us up because if we do, we'll soon have no one at all. Mm -hmm. And so they're anxious to, to maintain some kind of unity. And that's, I think, one of the major questions at the heart of all the Sermon of Mosiah is, how do we maintain the unity of the people? Okay. And so that points us to another good topic, because you're saying the <clears throat> sermons are question, asking the question, how do we maintain this unity? And yet, uh, one of the most noticeable features of Mosiah is just how many governments we get introduced to, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we have King Benjamin and Zenith and his people and King Noah and King Limhi. And then at the end, Mosiah disbands the monarchy altogether. And so it really does seem to have a lot of political focus in the, in the plot, or at least in the, in the right. story that's happening there. Um, and, and so you identify that there's a tension that comes up between government and religion. And this will get, I guess, more into chapter two. I'm just kind of walking through the different parts of the book. Um, and uh, King Noah, you say, he seems to believe that power can resolve differences, especially right. his power. Yeah. And, uh, but, the, but the subtitle of the chapter is the futility of politics. Yeah. So, so talk about that. What, does Mosiah lead us to believe that politics are futile or if they're futile, then what, what's their role? What yeah. yeah, I, I, I think the, the answer is yes. If, if what you think is that uh, what we do politically is going to bring about some kind of heaven on earth, that we will re be able to resolve all these tensions in some ultimate fashion and make everyone happy and bring about the well-being of all. If you think politics can do that, that's a mistake. It's futile. It can't, it, if that's its purpose, it's futile. Mm -hmm. Now, nevertheless, and, and I do think there is a way of unifying people. It's called the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, their politics has a purpose, and that is we do need to organize ourselves. Mm -hmm. We do need to find uh, the most efficient ways to bring about our well-being. And that's what politics is for. But the mistake is to think that somehow if we had this particular political system, whether it's the authoritarian or the democratic or the go down the list, that some particular th th political system is the answer to the question of human happiness. Right. right. It's not a sort of a plug and play. You yeah. plug in the right political system and then you get the right human right. behavior or right. something like that. OK, so um, what then actually saves people well, what you find in, yeah. I mean, I guess the, you talked about the gospel of yeah, I think Jesus that Christ. That's, that's what uh, uh, Benjamin is teaching his people. Now he, he, it's very interesting to me, he's preaching to a people who he, ha, he begins before they really is doing the sermon by saying, these are really good people. Mm -hmm. They keep the commandments. And then he preaches a sermon and they all fall down thinking, 
I'm, you know, nothing. I'm nothing. Right. That's a very, I mean, this isn't your usual state conference, uh -huh. right? <laughs> right. Um, and so I, it's a very interesting thing that's going on here. And what is King Benjamin trying to do? He is not really trying to say to them, you need to keep more commandments than you keep now. Mm -hmm. He's saying to them, your hearts have to be changed. Now, your behavior is fine, but your hearts have to be changed. And that means recognizing that your Heavenly Father created you and that until you turn to him, you still remain nothing. You have to be recreated by him. And then what the irony is that that recreation means you have to serve. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, it isn't, a, it's not, a, this is not at all a gospel of power or of progress. This is a gospel of service. And so uh, Benjamin is really quite adamant that you have, we have to recognize our nothingness, which just means our creation by our Heavenly Father. Mm -hmm. And if we recognize that, then we can be something, but what we, could be, what we can be is a servant. Okay. Okay, so this, this gets into some other good questions. I mean, because you, chapter three spends a lot of time talking about nothingness and what nothing could mean. And you've talked about that, about the recreation there. Um, and then, and then kind of where you, where you just ended, one of the things that it says on, uh, in chapter three is to receive a remission of sins means to have been made like the Lord of heaven, a servant. It means to have been lowered as he was, and then raised as he was. So what, I mean, I don't know if this is too hard to explain, but what is that? Talk about one of the definitions of nothing can be formlessness mm -hmm. being unformed and then your heart still has to be recreated with God. How do you go from formlessness to a servant? <clears throat> I think that what I would say is I think that, let me add another earlier step. Okay. So there is our first creation where we're made into persons, mm -hmm. right? And we're given a form, we're given, and I think another way to say it is we're organized in a certain way. And when we fall into sin, that organization, and that and organization doesn't just mean something internal, it means our relations with other persons, it goes afoul. Uh -huh. Something doesn't work. Like the fall. Like the fall. Right. right. Okay. That's when we sin, we have this break in our relationship with our Heavenly Father. And, but it's also a break in our relationship with other persons. Mm -hmm. What has to happen is that has to be fixed. We have to be recreated, we have to be reorganized. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the atonement does. The atonement is the reorganization of uh, our relationships with our Heavenly Father and each other that Jesus Christ makes possible. Now, when that happens, then we, we, we go from the nothingness of sin, this disorganization that sin brings about, we, we get a new form. Mm -hmm. And the form is the form of Jesus. Okay. But who is Jesus? Jesus is the servant of all. Mm -hmm. right. Right. And in that even, he's imitating his own father. Right. right. So this is, this is the irony. And this is why um, we talk often about I mean, mysteries of the, of the gospel, and Benjamin talks about the mysteries. This is a mystery to the world, uh -huh. right? How is it that you say, well, what, is, what is, am I going to get out of this? Well, what you get out of this is you get to be a servant. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's, that's a really interesting way to think about it. If you take the form of God, then you take the form of serving. And so, and so this leads right into the, the fourth chapter, because the fourth chapter looks at the question of, are we not all beggars? Mm -hmm. And what does it mean to be a beggar? And there's a, uh, maybe I'll just share two, um, two passages from this chapter, and then we can ask you to talk about how they, they fit together. Um, so you have one that says, God is not the king of the universe. He is its supreme servant like we've been talking about. His divine power is revealed in his willingness to lower himself 
his willingness to not take power. So again, there's something about that dynamic of, of serving instead of ruling or mm -hmm. something like that. And then in uh, another, let me get this other selection here, later in the chapter, you say, there is a direct connection between my social relation to the person who has nothing, which is be the beggar, and my standing before God. Standing before God, I am the person who has nothing. I am the person about to perish on the dung heap. Those who have received of God's substance, the divine grace and glory that makes him who he is, will give of their substance to those who have nothing, because they had nothing and were given divine substance. Those who do not impart of their substance have spurned gods. So we've got this, God doesn't take power. And then you also have uh, this thing about when I stand before God, I, I'm the beggar, I'm, I don't have anything. But, so, I mean, and there's lots of pages in between those two. Yeah. So can you talk <laughs> about the relationship between, between those? Well, it seems to me that um, when God reveals himself, so the father reveals himself through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And so when God reveals himself as a servant, uh, and then he also helps us understand that we are beggars, that we have nothing. Mm -hmm. What he reveals is his willingness to serve us. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we can come to him with demands. Uh, we are, after all, nothing, right? But when, but it does mean that when we come to him, we are not coming in the way that we imagine a groveling servant coming to this majestic king who, who hands out whatever rewards he wants and then or holds back right. in some arbitrary fashion. Instead, we are coming to someone who loves us and wants to serve us, and that seems to me to be the connection that on the one hand uh we we recognize that we're nothing we come to know that and then when we see the beggar we see ourselves before god now if we see ourselves before god and we see we say then i want to imitate god what that means is i want to serve this person who is begging mm -hmm. um i don't i'm not dispensing of my bounty in some noble noble way <laughs> right. i am that person's brother or sister i am the person who is called upon by the beggar to give of my substance or substance means what i am mm -hmm. i have to just as jesus christ gave what he was for us we have to give what we are for the person who begs from us mm -hmm. That's a, that's a, I don't know, it's a humbling way to think about it. We have to give of ourself yeah. to others. Um, okay, so, so we've <coughs> seen that there's this book that is written out of order to highlight different um, sermons. And one of the things you talk about is that one of the reasons it seems to have been written out of order is so that something about Benjamin's sermon can help us understand Abinadi's sermon. And then you, it also talks about this book about government, that government or politics can't save us. And what saves us is counterintuitive that we're going to uh, have to be nothing and become a servant. So then taking all of that to uh, Mosiah 15, those opening verses. What, what do, you, what is the, what do those verses show? I mean, maybe, <clears throat> maybe outline what is the conundrum or the confusing yeah. part about those verses, and then. Well, the conundrum is the the all that Abinadi says about uh, the father being the son and the son being the father and right. that kind of thing. And I've tried to in the book to parse phrase by phrase what's going on there uh -huh. to show how the best ways of seeing how to understand that but i i guess i think ultimately what i would say is uh what abinadi is doing and this is why benjamin sermon comes first mm -hmm. 
The priests of King Noah are reading Isaiah and they don't get it. Mm -hmm. And they just, they, I mean, so they challenge Abinadi. Explain this to us, we dare you. And he says, okay, I'll explain it. But when he explains it, it's as if they don't get it, you know, even more. Right. And the reason they don't get it is that what he's explaining is that the father reveals himself in the son who comes down amongst human beings. And the priests of Noah are like most people of the world at any given time who say a God doesn't really come down and become a human being. Uh -huh. right. He might, some might believe that a God can show up and deal with human beings, but they're still gods. They still have these hidden powers or whatever. Mm -hmm. But Jesus comes down as a baby in a poor family, mm -hmm. in a poor village, you know, I mean, and is raised just as a normal child, maybe not a completely normal child, but um, evidently most people were surprised when it turned out that he was, you know, a, a prominent rabbi, much less the savior of the world. So this is a, this is just an unbelievable story. Right. And the priests of Abinadi, excuse me, the priests of Noah are saying, this, you're being ridiculous. This is just complete. And in fact, they accuse him of blasphemy, mm -hmm. right? He must be crazy speaking blasphemy because he says that God can become a human being. So Abinadi's point is not a point about some metaphysical doctrine about how the father and the son are related. It's a point about the fact that Jesus Christ is the representative, representative of his father who comes down among us. That's what he's, now I think that he doesn't always say that the most clearly in those first few verses. Uh -huh. uh, there are a couple of sentences or at least one sentence that he forgets to finish. Uh -huh. He goes, starts, and then he just changes his mind. So it, it is a little bit confusing. I think we can make sense of it, but I think that we best make sense of it when we understand that he doesn't care about those theological conundrum that we are concerned with. He cares about preaching that Jesus Christ is going to come down amongst us. When, when I was uh, working on those verses, I really had a kind of, uh, um, I don't know quite what to call it, but I'm a little nervous about calling a revelation because I'm not sure how much I want to claim, uh -huh. but it was more than just an insight. Something happened to me <clears throat> and most of my life, uh, in the church, uh, whenever I think about the second coming, I think, oh yes, there will be a second coming, but m its most important meaning for me is that I must be ready to be prepared to meet Jesus at any moment. And I, th I think that's fine. I don't have a problem with that. But as I was reading this, I thought Abinadi is with these priests and for him, the most important thing he can preach is, Jesus Christ is actually going to come at a time that you don't know about and I don't know about. And reading that, I thought, I'm in the same position, not in, not physically, obviously, but I'm in the same kind of religious position that Abinadi was in with regard to the world. And even with regard to my own previous belief. I think it, it became very important for me to recognize that the literal com second coming is an, an, an a crucial part of what it is that I should be teaching and believing. And the, the other versions of what it means for there to be a second coming are also important. I don't want to deny those, but I think reading Abinadi made me realize I need to be able to say, I believe that Jesus Christ is going to come down and reign on this earth as a human being. I mean, as a divine human being, yeah. but as a person. Uh, and I know that today's priests of Abinadi, who are much nicer, they're not going to kill me, but they will think that I'm being ridiculous. But it still 
has to be said. Mm -hmm. It's still true. That's still uh, that, that. I mean, that's very striking just hearing you talk about it. And, and it seems like that is one of the one of or maybe the signature message of the Church of Jesus Christ of the latter days. Yeah, I think this that's is right. This is what's happening. Is that's right. Happening? Well, that's great. Um, thank you, Jim. Is there anything you want to share before we open it up for questions? Um, this was, uh, I think it, I hope it's obvious from our discussion that this experience of being asked to write this book was, uh, a very important moment in my spiritual development. Um, and so I think I learned a great deal. I hope, and my worry is that it was great for me, but maybe not for when they, people read my book, they're going to say, well, not so great for me. It was it was way better for me to write the book. I wrote. The <laughs> yeah. So yeah. Uh, but I'm hoping that it will also it was such a blessing for me to write it. I'm hoping it will also be a blessing to people who read it. Well, I'm sure it will be. I hope that people have the chance to to read it. <laughs>